namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa I send greetings to all of my Buddhist friends, wherever they might be. And I hope especially that in these very difficult and challenging times, they are all keeping healthy, safe, secure, that they are able to keep calm and patient with the somewhat draconian conditions that are being imposed on us all, and that they are especially able to use whatever extra leisure time they have to dive deeper into the waters of the Dharma. I'm speaking here at Wangyan Monastery, and usually when we have the Vesak celebration, we have hundreds of people coming, and we have a beautiful ceremony for bathing the image, the statue of the little baby, newborn Buddha. And then we have a communal lunch, and then we have a talent show in the afternoon. But now, because the monastery is closed, the gates are chained, <coughs> and people have to stay at home, so we're not able to have a public Vesak celebration this year. So instead, I'm making a video which will be sent to several Buddhist centers to play to, because my contribution to the celebration of Vesak. And Vesak, as probably all of you know, in the Theravada Buddhist tradition, is the day which has been chosen to commemorate the birth, enlightenment, and the parinibbana, or passing away of the Buddha. Vesak is actually the name for the month, a month that corresponds to April and May in the Western calendar, and the main Vesak. Day, day for commemorating the Buddha is the full moon day of Vesak, the Vesak Purnima, or Vaisaka Purnima day, the full moon day. And so this is a day that we bring to mind the Buddha, his excellent qualities, his teaching, his message, and the ongoing significance of the Buddha himself and of his teaching for the world. And in my <clears throat> reflections on the Buddha today, I want to focus in on certain qualities or epithets that are used to designate the Buddha in the familiar formula for the recollection of the Buddha. The qualities that I want to focus on are anuttaro purisa dhammasarati Sata Deva Manusanang, which means that the Buddha is the unsurpassed trainer of persons to be tamed and the teacher of deities and human beings. So these two epithets represent the Buddha in his function of being a teacher. They show that the Buddha teaches all types of intelligent, sentient beings, not only human beings, but also the devas, the deities. And in fact, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha, the first chapter in that collection is called the Devatas, the Devatas Sangyutta. And then the second chapter is the Deva Puta Sangyutta. And in those two chapters, each sutta takes place as a dialogue between the Buddha and a deity. It's said that in the Buddha's daily routine, he interacts and teaches human beings during the daytime and the early part of the night, but late at night when everybody else is asleep, when the monastery has become quiet, when there are no other activities going on, in the still of the night, the devas come down from the various heavenly realms to pay homage to the Buddha and to ask the Buddha questions. Usually they ask the questions in the form of verse, 
and the Buddha responds in verses. So in this way, we have two chapters in the Sangyutta Nikaya, which consist entirely of dialogues between the Buddha and the deities. And these two chapters are very, very rich in meaning. Some of the suttas, especially the verses, are extraordinarily deep, dealing with very intricate and knotty points of Dhamma. So they're not easy, but for those who really want to study the Dhamma and to sort of see into the way the Buddha deals with some deep and difficult points of Dhamma, I recommend reading those chapters. But even though the Buddha is said to be a teacher of the deities, the devas, most of his teaching activity was directed to human beings. So the Buddha is the teacher of manusanang, of human beings. And particularly, he is anuttaro purisadhamma sarati. The word sarati literally means one who operates a chariot, the driver of a chariot. And in ancient India, the driver of the chariot had to tame the animals that were to pull the chariot. Usually they would be horses, but I think that there were some kinds of chariots that were pulled by an elephant. So the charioteer, the chariot driver, would take the wild horses or a wild elephant and then using skillful means would tame the horses or the elephant so it became quite tame and docile and amenable to human control. And so in this epithet, people, the people who are be, to be trained by the Buddha are metaphorically compared to these animals that have to be trained. And the Buddha is compared to the trainer. And an elephant trainer or a horse trainer has to use different techniques to train the animal. Of course, the animal can be wild, and so sometimes they have to use rough techniques, harsh techniques, sometimes gentle techniques, sometimes a combination of both. And so we see that in the suttas, when we look at the suttas, we see that the Buddha uses many different methods to tame the people, to train people. Sometimes, well, usually, when the Buddha is teaching, his method is a gentle method. Since the Buddha, out of compassion, he prefers to be soft and gentle in dealing with people. But sometimes the Buddha will meet or come across people who are stubborn, obstinate, violent, destructive, pr proud, conceited, arrogant, rough-tongued. And when he deals with those people, the Buddha has to be rough in turn. This doesn't mean that he becomes violent or destructive in any way, but he'll be strong and forceful in using the techniques that are appropriate to tame and train those types of people. And when we look in the suttas and in the commentaries which relate the stories of the life of the Buddha, we find the Buddha teaches and trains such an amazing diversity of people, people from many different walks of life. Sometimes he'll encounter, in the Indian culture of that period, encounter Brahmins, Brahmins who will be very learned in the Vedas, very, because of their skill, of their knowledge of the Vedas, and because of their high social status, they might be very proud and arrogant and look down at people from the other castes and denigrate them, despise them. But the Buddha is able to deal skillfully, effectively in teaching the Brahmins. Often the Buddha will encounter kings and princes. These are people from the Kshatriya, the aristocratic or ruling class. And the Buddha himself came from a kshatriya background, and so the Buddha would know how to deal with them successfully. And often when the Buddha speaks to the kshatriyas, he will use similes and analogies from their own background, from their own experience. Images and similes of war, of weapons, of soldiers, 
And in this way, he's able to teach and transform the people of come from the Kshatriya caste and turn them into his disciples and lead them to the highest goal. <clears throat> Probably the majority of the Buddha's lay supporters came from the Vaishya caste. These are the householders who engage in business and in agriculture, trade, merchants, and so forth. And when speaking with them, the Buddha would draw upon similes and anecdotes and metaphors taken from the business world, how a businessman can acquire wealth and accumulate wealth and use his wealth in skillful means, in skillful ways. And sometimes the Buddha will speak to people from the Shudra caste. Those are the manual workers, the laborers, the laboring caste. And again, the Buddha will place himself on their level and speak to them in ways that they could understand, using similes, analogies, metaphors from the everyday life of work in the world. And so the Buddha was such a skillful teacher. And sometimes the Buddha will meet those who are considered outside and beyond the caste system. These are the people that were referred to as the outcasts, the, vas uh, the outcasts, the chandalas, people who were looked down so low, despised even by the people from the working class. And yet the Buddha, out of his compassion, would speak to the chandalas, the outcasts, and guide and lead them to his teaching. The reason why the Buddha was able to employ such a variety of skillful means and to teach people in exactly the way that's appropriate for themselves comes because the Buddha possesses two special powers of knowledge, which are mentioned among, there's a set of powers of knowledge that are ascribed to the Buddha, 10 powers of knowledge. And amongst these, we find one power of knowledge is called the knowledge of the diversity in the mental dispositions of sentient beings. So the Buddha understands the different dispositions of people. He knows which beings, which people have their main problem is the problem of greed and craving, desire. He knows other people, their main problem is anger, ill will, resentment. Other people are dull and stupid. Some people are proud and conceited. Other people have too low opinion of themselves. They're self-denigrating, self-depreciating. Other people are governed by doubt, always questioning, always doubting, unable to develop faith. Other people are restless and agitated. Some people are extremely intelligent with very sharp minds, very keen, penetrating intellects. Other people are disposed towards devotion, trust, and worship. So the Buddha, when he encounters a person, he doesn't really have to ask questions or to examine the person at length, but he has a special power of knowledge so that he could direct his mind to the mind of the other person and know what are that person's defects, what are their faults, what are their shortcomings, what is their karmic background from the past. And he could also know what are the hidden virtues in that person, what are the potentials in that person for spiritual advancement, for awakening, for enlightenment. And in this way, the Buddha can adapt the teaching to exactly speak to that person in the way that will awaken their trust and confidence and guide them step by step 
along the path of cultivation to the deepest realizations of wisdom. So one of these special powers of knowledge is the knowledge of the diversity in the dispositions or mental inclinations of sentient beings. The other knowledge seems a little similar, is the knowledge of the diversity, the superiority or inferiority in the spiritual faculties of sentient beings. So the texts speak about five qualities as being indriyas or spiritual faculties. These are the faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. So these qualities are called indriyas, spiritual faculties, because these are the faculties that lead and guide us and direct us as we embark on our spiritual journey. And so as we enter upon the path and cultivate the path to enter, we need faith. Once we have that faith, we have to take up the practice using energy. Energy means making an effort, the right effort, to overcome our weaknesses, our defilements, the unwholesome dispositions of the mind, and to develop and strengthen the wholesome qualities of the mind, so that is energy. Then the heart of the practice is the development of mindfulness and concentration. And when mindfulness and concentration become strong enough, then they issue in panya, or wisdom, the insight which penetrates the truth. And so these are five potentials of the human mind. And when the Buddha encounters somebody, he can directly and immediately assess and determine the degree of development of these faculties in the person that he meets. He can see whether that person has strong faith or weak faith, whether they're energetic or lazy, whether they can be mindful or instead forgetful, whether they are concentrated or distracted, whether they have the potential for wisdom or are dull and doubtful and foolish. And so by assessing the degree of development of the faculties of the people he meets, the Buddha is able to instruct them in the ways that are necessary for developing their faculties further until when all of those faculties come together, they're capable of making that breakthrough to realization and attaining the various stages of enlightenment. We find in the suttas and the commentaries many stories about the Buddha's encounters with people the people to be trained and tamed. And I just want to summarize a few of these interesting stories which really light up the text and make them so lively, so vital, so inspiring, so memorable. So it's not just a matter of learning the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, Dependent Origination, and so forth. But what makes the Dhamma really living and accessible to us are the stories, the stories about the Buddha's encounters with people, his own contemporaries, who might be people very much like us in a different culture, a different society. One story that comes to mind is the story about the Buddha's encounter was a Brahmin. This story occurs in the Sutta Nipata. So the Buddha was <coughs> going to a village on his alms round, and at the time 
this Brahmin was performing a ceremony. It was a big ceremony to begin the planting season, the sowing season. And so the Brahmin had his, many of his followers with him, and the Brahmin had his ox, his bullock, and he was going to start plowing the field. And just then, the Buddha comes by and stands by the Brahmin with his alms bowl, holding out the alms bowl. And then, as though he was expecting the Brahmin to make an offering to himself. But when the Brahmin saw the Buddha, he felt angry towards the Buddha, displeased to be seeing this ascetic come walking by with an alms bowl. And he said to the Buddha, I am a plowsman, I am a farmer. I plow the field, I sow the seeds, I cultivate my fields. When the crops ripen, I harvest them. And in that way, I'm able to feed myself, to feed my household and the many people that depend on me. But who are you? What are you? You're just a beggar, a parasite. You go around, you don't do any work. You just take your bowl, you go wandering from place to place expecting people to feed you. Don't act like that. You should start sowing. You should plow the fields. You should grow the crops. And then you'll be able to obtain your harvest of, of grain to make food. So when the Buddha heard this from the Brahmin, he said to the Brahmin, you sow and plow and gain your crops, I too sow my field. I, I too plow my field, sow the seeds, and gather my crops. And when the Buddha said this, the Brahmin was puzzled. He said, I never, I've seen you walking on arms from place to place. I've never seen you plowing and sowing. What do you mean? So the Brahmin was puzzled now. And then the Buddha, using similes based on the plowing instruments and the process of plowing the field and sowing the seeds, explained how he uses the different factors of the Dhamma, energy, mindfulness, wisdom, morality, energy, as his plow for plowing the field, the field of the hearts and minds of sentient beings. And he sows the seeds. The seeds are the principles of his dharma, of his teaching. He sows these seeds in the hearts of living beings, the people who come to him for guidance. And when he sows these seeds, he says, these seeds nurtured by the rain of his teaching, nurtured by the fertilizer of his teaching, these seeds gradually grow up and bear their fruit. And their fruit is not like rice or wheat, but the fruit of those seeds is nirvana, nibbana, the deathless. And when the Brahmin heard this from the Buddha, these verses, which were so precise and spoken in the idiom, the language that he was accustomed to, using similes based on the instruments of plowing and farming, immediately faith and devotion arose in his mind, and he became a disciple of the Buddha, make an offering to the Buddha, and became his disciple. So this is one story that comes to my mind, how the Buddha was skilled in addressing that Brahman. <clears throat> Another story comes to mind is this of a consort of King Bimbisara. Bimbisara was the king of the state of Magadha, which was the powerful state 
in northeast India, which corresponds roughly to present-day Bihar. And the capital of Magadha was Rajagaha. And the king ruling at that time, who was himself already a disciple of the Buddha, was named Bimbisara. And Bimbisara had his wife, who was the queen, but he also had a consort, a beautiful woman, whose name was Kema. And when Kema came to keep company with King Bimbisara, King Bimbisara would praise, in her presence, he would praise the Buddha again and again and speak so highly of the Buddha. But Kema, his consort, heard that the Buddha was, of course, he was a celibate renunciant. He was an ascetic, a monk. And so she thought, these ascetics, these monks, have no interest in women. They turn away from women. They disparage women. I don't want to go to see him. And she was very, very proud of her beauty. And she had heard that the Buddha teaches about the impure, unattractive nature of the body. So she was afraid that if she were to go to hear the Buddha preach, that she wouldn't like his teaching because she was vain and proud about the beauty of her face, her beautiful figure. But finally, King Bimbisara said, if you want to continue to be my consort, you have to go to listen to the Buddha. And so very reluctantly, she decided that she had no choice, and so she would go to hear the Buddha preach. And so she went to see the Buddha, and when the Buddha saw came a coming, he knew two things about her. At once, as soon as he saw her, immediately he knew two things. One, he knew that she was very proud about her beauty, and that that pride, that conceit based on her beauty was the big barrier to her spiritual development, and that if that conceit and arrogance based on her beauty continued, she would never be able to absorb and accept his teaching. So that was the first thing that the Buddha knew about Kema. The second thing that he knew about her is that she had the potential for arahatship, that in many past lives she had practiced under previous Buddhas, and in fact, she had made the aspiration in a previous life to become the chief female monastic disciple of the Buddha, to become the bhikkhuni who is foremost in wisdom. And so Kema came to the assembly where the Buddha was teaching, and a bit reluctantly, maybe somewhat shy, she sat, maybe took a seat in the back row, looking up and listening to the Buddha teach. And now the Buddha, in order to transform, to change Kema, he made use of his psychic powers, and he created, right next to him, a beautiful young girl, maybe 16 years old, of radiant, brilliant, scintillating beauty, sitting right behind the Buddha with a fan fanning the Buddha. And so when Kema looked out and saw this beautiful girl, she reflected back on herself and thought, everybody says I'm beautiful, but this girl is so much more beautiful than I am. Wow, I'm just nothing compared to that girl. And she was feeling a little bit maybe downcast, but also a little more bit competitive in her mind. 
how can I make myself more beautiful than that girl? Okay, now the Buddha, he's teaching, continuing to talk, but at the same time, he's using his psychic power to make that beautiful girl almost imperceptibly advance quickly in her age. So when she appeared first, she was like 16 years old. Now, in one minute, she looks like she's 21 years old, maybe the same age as Kama. So Kama looks again. That girl, she doesn't look like 16. She looks like 21. She looks like she could almost my age. Okay, again, the Buddha uses his psychic power. Kama looks again. Now she looks like she's 28, 29, 30 years old. And the Buddha continues using his psychic powers. Now she's 40 years old, 50 years old, 60, 70, 80 years old, an old woman sitting there fanning the Buddha. And of course, Kema is getting, on the one hand, she's puzzled by the way that girl has grown old so quickly, but also she's starting to feel proud again because she thinks she's more beautiful then the old woman, then the old woman turns 85 years old, and then she falls down and dies. And when Kama sees that the young girl has turned old so quickly, has died and collapsed, then she reflects back on herself and thinks, now I'm so beautiful. But if we speed up the time by which human life flies by, I will be growing older and older and older until I'm like that old lady, and then I will die, collapse, and my body will disintegrate. So what is the value of this bodily beauty? And as she reflected in this way and saw that the body is impermanent, the mind is impermanent, everything conditioned is impermanent, right on the spot, she attained arahatship. And then she came to the Buddha, asked to become a bhikkhuni, and before long, the Buddha appointed her as the bhikkhuni, or female monastic disciple, foremost in wisdom. Another story from the life of the Buddha that I find very deeply touching is the story about the Buddha's encounter with an outcast by the name of Sunita. This story comes in the Theragata. It's the verses spoken by Sunita. Sunita was a man who was born in one of the lowest classes in Indian society. He was, his job was like a garbage collector. He would go at the, early in the morning, he would go to the houses and collect, the people would just throw the garbage outside the house, and he would go with his equipment and sweep up the garbage and collect it, and then bring it to the garbage dump and throw it away. And so one day, he was, on his cleanup rounds, going behind the houses, cleaning up the garbage. And then he sees, in the corner of his field of vision, he sees a group of people walking towards him. He wonders, who is this? And he looks up, and who is it? But it's the Buddha at the head of a group of monks, a group of monks following the Buddha. And so Sunita, he's known about the Buddha by his reputation. Maybe he's seen him before on alms round. And he thinks, oh, it's the Samana Gotama, the ascetic Gotama that they call the enlightened one is coming towards me. And I'm just a worthless outcast. I should, shouldn't be in the way of the Buddha. Even I shouldn't even let my shadow fall on the Buddha. It might contaminate him. And so Sunita goes, tries to get out of the way, but he's up against the wall, 
and the Buddha comes up closer and closer and Sunita is like frozen in place. He can't move. And then the Buddha comes in front and Sunita is sort of cowering. He thinks, I'm just a worthless outcast and here is this great spiritual master in front of me. I have to get out of the way, but there's no place to go. Then the Buddha turns to Sunita and smiles at him very gently and sends out rays of metta and karuna, loving kindness and compassion towards Sunita. And then to his surprise, Sunita is crouching there. Sunita says to the Buddha, Master Gotama, can I become a monk? Somehow the thought just came into his mind. I want to become a monk. So he says, can I become a monk? And the Buddha says, you are welcome. You can come into my Sangha and become a monk. And so here Sunita, an outcast, is brought into the Sangha, ordained as a monk by the Buddha. And then Sunita practices very diligently. He gets his meditation instruction directly from the Buddha, practices diligently until after some time, maybe a week or two weeks, he attains arhatship together with the sup certain super knowledges. He gains the recollection of his past lives remembering life before life before life, hundreds and hundreds of lives. He gets the divine eye by which he can see other realms of existence and see how living beings pass on from death to rebirth in accordance with their karma. And he gains the knowledge of liberation, the knowledge of the destruction of all defilements. And so he becomes an arahat, possessing the triple knowledge, the three higher knowledges. And sometime shortly after his attainment of arahatship, one night, a, light, a, a night with the full moon shining, Sunita is sitting out on a rock, sitting absorbed in meditation. And the Buddha is also sitting out by his cottage, absorb, absorb, observing the monastery. And as Sunita is sitting out on his rock, Saka, who is the king of the gods in the Tavatingsa heavenly world, the sense sphere heavenly world, the king of the gods, comes down to the rock in front of Sunita and bows down to Sunita, the former outcast, the former garbage collector. So Saka comes down, pays homage to Sunita, and then returns to his heavenly world. And then, a little bit later, Maha Brahma, the ruler of the Brahma world, the, regarded as the supreme deity by the followers of the Vedas, the Brahmins, comes down from the Brahma world in front of Sunita and pays homage to Sunita and then returns, returns to the Brahma world. And the Buddha is observing this. And then the Buddha recites some verses. He says, it's not by birth or by caste, by family lineage, that one becomes a true Brahmin. But one becomes a true Brahmin by diligent practice, by one's purity of life, by one's wisdom, by the pur purity of one's mind. Those are the qualities that make one a true Brahmin. And so, from the standpoint of social convention, Sunita is at the bottom of the social scale, and the Brahmins are at the top. 
but in terms of spiritual cultivation, spiritual realization. Sunita is the real Brahman, the one that even Mahabrahma, the god of the Brahmins, comes down to worship. And this all happened because of the capacity of the Buddha to teach and transform this lowly, humble person and bring him to the highest levels of attainment. Okay, so these maybe are some stories from the life of the Buddha that we can recollect on this Vesak day or this Vesak month to inspire our faith and devotion towards the Buddha. But maybe the question comes to your mind, okay, these are stories from the past what is their relevance to us now in the present? One way that I could highlight their relevance is to realize that within the treasure store of the Buddha's teaching, there are many different methods that can help us to cultivate ourselves and to unfold, unwrap, draw out our own hidden spiritual potentials. So the Buddha has left this amazing legacy of many different methods of cultivation, some emphasizing faith and devotion, devotional practices, the activities like practice of dana, generosity, the recollection of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, bowing, reciting sutras, going on pilgrimage, worshiping the Buddha relics. So these are ways to cultivate ourselves and to strengthen faith and devotion. Then there are the different meditative methods that we can use, especially the methods like the four foundations of mindfulness, which aim to cultivate samadhi and wisdom, the four divine abodes, loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, and equanimity in order to develop our noble qualities of character. And then the teachings like Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, the Three Characteristics, and so forth that help us to develop our wisdom. And then there's the encouragement to do different deeds of merit, especially ways of putting compassion into practice. And I would say in our current age, this is especially important for us to follow the Buddha's example, the way in many past lives, he always found opportunities to help, to benefit, to uplift other people other living beings. And so in this way, the Buddha serves as a guide, a model for the practice of compassion. And in today's world, we see so much suffering, so much affliction, so much misery, that we have to, in order to pay homage to the Buddha, we should find ways to put compassion into action by uplifting those who are unfortunate, who are struggling, just to get by. And so when we look at this vast range of the Buddha's teachings that the Buddha has left to us, we find that these teachings, though the Buddha has passed into nirvana, but the Buddha still lives for us and among us through the legacy of his teachings. So on this Vesak, let us commit ourselves more strongly than ever before to the practice and cultivation of the Buddha's teaching. So thank you all for your attention, and let me close by wishing you all the blessings of the Three Jewels. Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang Rakkantu Sabha Devata Sabha Buddhanu Bhavena Sada Soti Bhavantu Te Sabha Dhammanu Bhavena Sada Soti Bhavantu Te Sabha Sanganu Bhavena Sada so ti, bhavantu te.